Hello and welcome. My name is Anne Marie Smith. I am the Director of Curriculum Development for Dataversity. Thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss Enterprise Architecture. Hello and welcome. My name is Anne Marie Smith and I'm the Director of Curriculum Development for Dataversity. Thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss enterprise architecture versus data architecture. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. We will be collecting questions via the Q&A panel on the bottom of your screen. And if you'd like to chat with us, or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and QA panels, you find those icons at the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing the links to the slides and recording of this session. We will also send additional information requested that during the webinar. And now let me introduce the speaker of this monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor over to Donna to begin her presentation. Hello, Donna, and welcome. Hello, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Always good to see some familiar names in the participants and, and looking forward to chatting with folks as, as it progresses. So um, if this is your first time joining these series, um, it is a series. Um, if you've missed any of the previous sessions, uh, Dataversity is very good about hosting um, these recordings on their website um, in years back as well. So if any of these topics you missed and you wanna catch us, head to the Dataversity web, uh, website as well as the Global Data Strategy website where we link to Dataversities um, also. But today's topic is enterprise architecture versus data architecture, which we've seen is kind of a popular one this, um, this time. So really looking forward to getting into it. So what we're going to cover today is enterprise architecture. And we'll go over a little of what that means, but a simple way of thinking of it is that interrelationship between not just data and data architecture, which is normally what we talk about on this series, but also linking it with process or business process or applications and business capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Because, and you've, if you've heard me speak before, this probably shouldn't be new to you that I'm, I'm a fan of this holistic view, but it, to me, it's, it's not data in a vacuum. Um, but it's the interrelationships between data and the impact of data on the business that really is well, why we're doing this, right? So um, as we go through this webinar, we obviously we'll keep our focus on data architecture, but more how data architecture can kind of have these touch points with the other areas um, and the layers um, of the onion, as we say, uh, with enterprise architecture as well. So let us jump right in. So what is enterprise architecture? I, I, I gave a definition, but if you've Again, if you've heard me speak before, I tend to go to Gartner IT Glossary. I think they've got a good definition of definitions. And if you're a data architect or a data management person, we love ourselves a good glossary, right? So what I liked about their definition is um, enterprise architecture, like everything, like data architecture, and, and maybe I'm going to start already with one of Donna's little rants, but um, it, it feels like anything foundational can be sort of given the moniker of, oh, that's old fashioned. We don't need it anymore. And I'm not sure why. Uh, because, you know, how is data and its relationship with the business not top of mind everybody right now? So what I liked about Gartner's definition is, is it puts that front and center is where enterprise architecture is, is a response to the disruptive forces um, of, of analyzing execution and, and vision and change. And it's really all about innovation. And that's what I think so as well. It really is used to evolve that future state architecture. And it's just planning for that. Crazy idea, right? So really understanding if you're going to do something like a digital transformation or 
anything data driven that's going to affect the enterprise, you want to map out ahead of time, like a roadmap to anything you've, you're doing between the impacts that data is going to have. And that really is a key force for driving things like innovation, especially in the digital world. So if you're, if you are a data architect, welcome. <laughs> I'm a data architect by trade, I'm proud to be one. Um, amongst other things. And, and I think if, if this idea of enterprise architecture is new to you as a data architect, it, it won't be too hard to grasp, right? And what I find sort of fun about that is that if, if you're used to modeling data, and there's kind of a fictitious data model there on the right, it's not too much of a jump to manage, ma to you know start to architect other things. And it may be strange, can you can you architect people's motivations or people's business goals? And you can, and that's why I sort of find it fun. It's just, you know, using the skills you have applied to other things like business capabilities, business processes, um, applications, networks, et cetera. We won't go through all of them, but you'll get the idea. But we will go through some of the key business-centric touch points. That's really where I think the value of um, data in the intersection with business really comes about. So a bit, a bit of background. There are several methodologies or frameworks for enterprise architects. Sure. Uh, one of the more famous ones is the Zachman framework. I, I think what's nice about John Zachman's work is that it is its simplicity, right? It's that classic who, what, where, why, when, um, and how. And, and data fits very nicely into that what column. And he also speaks to the different levels we're familiar with, sort of at the business or conceptual level before you go down to the logical and then the physical implementation, right? But we're not alone in that perspective, right? So a business map or a um, you know, an architecture from a system perspective, all can have those same levels. So if you're linking those together, having this type of framework can be really, really helpful. Um, you may also be familiar with kind of TOGAF um, and their, their methodology. Very similar in a way, right? You still have data and you're looking at that enterprise vision and then the touch points between data, business applications and tech, right? And it, again, uh, if you've heard me speak, I tend to say, learn the foundations understand them, understand the, the rigorous fundamentals, and then be a little loose with it. I'd rather have someone do a whiteboard definition of a capability model than not do one at all, right? So I think we can easily get overwhelmed, especially nothing against the TOGAF, it works very well, but it can seem overwhelming and heavy. And I can see where may maybe people get the idea that this is old fashioned and too much, but it absolutely isn't, right? Even starting out that, that kind of level one business view can be really transformational. Because data is really part of a broader enterprise architecture. We're not doing data in a vacuum. I think if we're on this call, we probably enjoy working with data, but we, we shouldn't just be doing data for data's sake. So um, and this is kind of a framework we often use, you know, starting with the business view, starting with the why. And there's just like if you look at the data view, you may be familiar with some of those concepts, a conceptual, logical, uh, physical model and that sort of thing. You have the same business motivations, business capabilities, um, process models, business process, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there are others. These are the ones, I guess, you know, when, when uh, full disclosure, I, I run a consultancy where we do this all the time. It works, right? So we, but this is sort of the ones we tend to use most often, the business view and the process view and the business capability view really give you some good context into to how data can be impactful to the organization. Um, so moving along, um, you may be aware, and this one just dropped, I think, last week or th this week, um, Data Diversity and Global Data Strategy Partner each year. I think it's been six or seven years now um, on a trends in data management report. So that's available, again, on the, on the uh, Data Diversity as well as the Global Data Strategy site. I think Shannon and team typically send out a link to these sorts of things after the webinar. So I'm sure that's going to be one of the questions. <laughs> um, but I found this was interesting because we explicitly asked the question, again, some context, this is a data diversity audience, so there will be a focus on data and the answers. We didn't just go to a broad generic group of people across the organization, across the, the planet. Um, but you'll see when you look at the types of models that are in use, no surprise to me that logical and conceptual models come up top. Just for kind of context, we didn't put all of the other years. It sort of goes back and forth between conceptual and logical being first and second which may be a surprise to some, because that's one of the things I keep hearing that nobody does anymore, but we don't see that in, in practice. I think what's good about them is that, again, that's the business focus, conceptual at an even more high level and logical as you're getting into more detail, but both of those have a business focus. 
and then your physical data models, of course, when you're starting to build out applications. But um, I think in terms of the enterprise architecture realm, business process models, um, you'll see is sort of higher on the list than others. I, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, we whenever we're doing anything with master data management or the impact of data and process, we always do. We'll, we'll talk about that in this call. Um, the, the intersection between business and process. System architecture diagrams, that one I'm a little surprised and disappointed that you wouldn't have more of that. I know it's always odd to me and, and you know, definitions, people have different definitions of system architecture, but even your classic, you know, uh, what, what are the other applications interacting with your data and your data applications? It, it's, we often do kind of a mix of a data flow and a system architecture diagram, your classic you know, left to right, if you're you're building a warehouse and your source systems in your integration layer and your transformation layer before your consumption layer, um, it just really helps map out the, the state of the game. Um, business capability models, you'll see, we'll talk about those today, only 13%, um, which I don't love. Um, not all companies do a business capability model. I found them really helpful. Um, and the good old fashioned CRUD matrix, you've sure if you've joined me, you've heard me talk about kind of the best tool with the worst name. Um, it kind of shows where data is created, read, updated, and deleted. And, and the classic one, right, if you're doing the impact of data, the impact of data is absolutely where data is created, read, updated, and deleted, right? So um, those are some of the tools. You can read some others. Um, but I thought that might be a helpful context of actually including some data about this topic as we go ahead. Um, and as we go through, and I kind of already talked about this a little bit, we want to be clear, like anything else, there's the architecture versus the construction, right? And I, I think, obviously, with a house, we're, we're sort of used to that. If you're just building a shed in the backyard, you probably don't need a design. Uh, but if you're building a house or, a, um, you know, a, a, a full-on, uh, you know, skyscraper, you, you probably should have some sort of design to make sure it works. Um, I think, as you can see from some of the um, figures there, that's becoming more common or, or more uh, you know, ubiquitous maybe uh, of let's design the data systems and not just run to building them. You know, and again, in a small app, that might be fine. Um, but, you know, you want to design the plan. Um, same thing again with business capabilities or business process, um, designing out before we just start something like a digital transformation or a, you know, uh, anything data related, a data driven business, artificial intelligence, right? Anything we're doing with data. Let's understand the business impact and, and map that out before we start. Same concept. One of the things I love being about being an architect, even just a good old fashioned data architect, let alone an enterprise architect, but I think even more with the enterprise uh, view is, is my old friend here, Janice, right? So uh, I was born in January, right? So the god of, of January, <laughs> which, which was Janice, the, the reason, one of the reasons January came to, to me, uh, came to be named after him is that you can see he's got kind of maybe creepy, but two heads, right? One is looking towards the new year and one looks back towards the old year. In my strange Donna brain, I kind of see that as an architect where you kind of get those two same two two heads or two sides of your head. A one where you really need to understand the business and map out the business and the impact and the other one flipping around and then looking at the technology, whether it's cloud or on-prem or, or what your data structures look like and, and optimizing performance and things like that. But you have to do both to truly call yourself an architect, I think, right? Or at least at the, the business architect level. Um, I think that's crucially important. And I kind of like this graphic to show that because that some days if you're if you are an architect, that might be how you feel, right? One minute you're talking doing business planning, next minute you're talking to the data engineer trying to optimize the platform, right? And part of the fun, I think. Um, so let, let's go through some of these architecture diagrams or the, the tools of the trade. Um, some may be new to you, some may be your old old friends, but um, maybe just talk about how they can fit together to really show some business impact. And, and I'll include some case studies where this has worked. So a business motivation model, um, it's one I discovered ooh, kind of about 10 years ago um, when I worked for more of a pure enterprise architecture consultancy. Um, and I found it really, really helpful. And, and none of these are overtly complex. I kind of call them the one pagers to start with. And we we in our practice typically do that. Like, let's understand on the business motivation, the why. What are we trying to do as an org? So this is a fictitious artful art supplies company. Um, and I, again, whether you do a full motivation model or just kind of a, a tip, um, when you're doing anything, whether your own own company that you work for, or if you're a consultant, the company you're working with, do you know the company's mission and vision, right? I know when I was young, I sort of always kind of rolled my eyes at that. Now I digest it and understand it. That is that is executives telling you what they're what they're planning to do, right? So in this case, Artful Art Supplies, they're going to be a 
full service online retail experience for art supplies worldwide and they want to have an online community of art enthusiasts and be the place to go. You know, maybe perhaps a brick and mortar before, right? So understanding that and then aligning what you're doing with data or any technology to that just makes so much sense. But I think we often skip that in the rush to just understand things, right? And then the internal drivers, what was this company trying to do? Better marketing, 360 view of com customer, really com building a community of people who are into art, right? In, in this case, and that often you can find that in the annual report, right? Or the, your CEO's, you know, summary to the company. Um, digest that, understand that, and see how you can map your data to that. And then look externally, right? The, this brick and mortar, you know, art supply, maybe they didn't realize that everyone's online now and looking through social media and really becoming influencers and that sort of thing. Maybe there's regulation in the industry and things that we need to pay attention to. So you don't want to only look internally. Yeah, it's important to look outside the company as well. So that's kind of putting almost your management consulting hat on, right, before you even get into data management. Um, but then I think the key is mapping that to your data-centric goals and objectives in the bottom. And I almost say, start with almost your, your marketing one-liners, right? Instead of going to management and saying, you know, we need to build a data governance framework and, and create data stewards, maybe look towards accountability and link that to things of going online and having that customer, um, you know, cust customer centric view. You want to have a good brand and reputation. We need to be accountable for, you know, people's PII and data, right? That's going to land a lot better than just saying, hey, we need to buy a data catalog, right? Because we need to do governance, right? So it's a bit of linking what you're doing with data to the, the mission of the company and making it a little catchier, right? You still want to say the realistic things you're doing, but, you know, instead of um, we need to, you know, do some data profiling and build a dashboard, it's, hey, we need quality. Just like our art has a high quality, our data needs to have high quality. We need a culture where everyone understands this, right? So it's kind of a helpful way. Again, we always do this when we're working with a new client. It helped. We, we, we would just do it ourselves. And we realize it's helpful for everybody to really ingest what we're trying to do and then wrap your brain around how data can support that. But again, it can be a simple one pager. But like you've heard me say before, if you've joined this, it's a lot easier to make something simple, take complexity and make it simple. Uh, I think it was a famous quote there. I didn't have um, time uh, to write you a short letter, so I wrote a long one, right? It's, it's a lot easier to ramble on or create complex technical diagrams, a lot harder to sum it up and really make it impactful. And that, this is a good example of that. So um, moving along. Um, this is one way to look at things. I, I it was an interesting way. Um, I've seen folks do it in the past, or sometimes we do it ourselves. Um, there's all of these different use cases for either this fictitious art company or any company in the world, right? It could be, you know, we're trying to, uh, I know these are sort of hard to read. We're trying to improve customer insights or customer experience or consumer marketing, et cetera, right? And then there's kind of sub-use cases within that, right? So if we're um, you know, trying to consumer marketing, there's cross-sell and upsell, there's campaign management, there's different groups, right? So that's getting very explicit, mapped to your business goals on that previous slide of what are the actual things we're doing. And just like a data model, there's kind of levels, right? Here's your high level, which might be consumer marketing, sentiment analysis, and then you're breaking those down into their components. What we often do on the right, and, and this is kind of a anonymized example of we work with a very large global company and we, we even mapped from what are the different markets, the local markets, what are the different functional areas that are interested in that? So if you kind of look at the heat map here, you'll see kind of, you know, KPI reporting on some of their network analysis was really top of mind. Um, so it kind of helps. I mean, there's other ways to prioritize. Sometimes we do a good old bar chart and things like that. But this was kind of more of an enterprise architecture way of kind of creating kind of a, a heat map and a, you know, you know, an inventory of all the different use cases kind of linked back to that business value. What we've also done um, is then do the data overlay on top of that. So then which of these boxes has customer, which of these box, boxes has product, and that kind of helps you kind of drive your data prioritization. So similar to that, kind of in this idea of uh, data overlay, um, a business capability model you, you saw from the survey isn't as popular as I'd, I'd like it to be. So I think we're all familiar with org charts, right? So in fact, when we're consultants, that's one of the first things we ask for. Can we understand the org chart? We put together a stakeholder matrix and things, but capabilities are a little different. It's not how you organize yourself, but what you do. And it sometimes takes the politics out of it, right? Because orgs change, capabilities change less regularly unless you really change what you do. So again, back to Artful's art supplies, 
what might they do? They might do some research and develop it for their products. They might do some branding and go to market. And just like everything else, you kind of have these, these sub layers. So level one might be the branding and go to market. And then you go into marketing and then you go into process, product messaging, branding, et cetera, right? I don't need to read all those to you. And some of those are probably standard for every type of company. Um, and then what we often do, think of your conceptual data model or your, your high level data domains, you can start to do an overlay um, you know, the, the bouncing ball, we had one, one customer call it, which is kind of a fun way to look at it, right? So you can see that heat map is the A, something like, probably not too surprising, campaign development and lead gen, pretty data centric. And what specific areas, it might be your customers and your products that you need to align, probably a whole lot more than that. But um, you can start to see that and that helps you kind of focus in not only your data prioritization, you can't start with everything, you can't boil the ocean, we've all heard that, but then you can more explicitly link back to what the benefits are to the business and you'll see the cross benefit, right? So it, it, we're all trying to get that quick win, right? So probably no surprise that starting with customer is not only gonna help marketing, it's gonna help product development, sales, you know, and so you can kind of see that across many areas, but um, it's worked really well. One particular case study, Two, two major organizations can't quite use their name in the public sector, but um, uh, we did a very uh, successful implementation of a, basically a data migration of two big financial companies. One was in London, one was in New York as their headquarters, and they were merging. Um, and these were both multi-billion dollar companies. Um, and the CEO I kind of joined the, the launch call when they had just been acquired, said out loud to the whole company, you know, the, one of the reasons we acquired company B was that the combined information assets of both companies is one of our biggest strategic advantages. Pretty awesome, right? We're all talking about being a data-driven company and you know that almost gets kind of trite because we hear it so much. Um, but this CEO, that was again, his main goal, right? Did he know how to make that happen? Did he, you know, is he gonna get into the, the nuts and bolts? Not yet, right? So that's kind of where we help come into play. Um, one of the first things we started with was a capability map, a, a business capability model, very similar to the one I kind of saw on the previous slide, but obviously aligned with them. And why that was nice um, is A, it helped um, kind of break down some of the complexity. Where do you start when you're trying to merge two massive multi-billion dollar companies with one had like a hundred year legacy and one was even you know, 150 years or something like that. Been a business for a long time, kind of breaking it down just like you would with the data model, what are the core components, right? And they, they have finance, they have marketing, they have research and development, right? And then it also takes the politics out of it. I mean, you can imagine they were layoffs, they were people changing managers and things like that. So rather than talk about departments and people and org, we just looked at capability, kind of neutral to us in the data group, right? Of you're gonna have finance, how do we support finance? and financial data by merging these two companies. And we started, you know, very similar to the one earlier, mapping the data then to that. That worked out really, really well. And it also helped them, um, you could just, this is a generic one, it wasn't theirs obviously, um, but it can also help you under, understand some of the capabilities and are they all relevant? Are we missing capabilities? Are we are we too um, strong, you know, too heavy in one and not heavy in enough? Are we missing things? Um, and it was really helpful in, in many accounts, not just, the data arena. So kind of a good success story of using a capability model that might, might be new to you. And again, I, I hear from folks and I guess we all feel that way of, you know, and imposter syndrome and I, I'm not, I'm not TOGAF certified. Can I, can I do something like this? Well, heck yeah. I mean, I just start by whiteboarding it. Right. I mean, and it might just, I, again, work, I, I'm a consultant and my, my team are consultants. So we kind of do this naturally when we come into a new company, because we that's what kind of was our light bulb moment. We would do this anyway to help understand the company. And then we showed it to the company themselves and people learned, you know, it was a really helpful thing, but no reason you can't do this for your own company, right? Let's map out. And and it also helps. Uh, we hear a lot when we're trying to uh, work with data teams, I'm trying to get buy-in from other groups. Do we even know who those other groups are, right? We naturally kind of live in our own si silos. You may work in IT and maybe you talk with a finance or a couple other groups, do you talk with marketing on a regular basis? Do you go to the R&D group, human resources, right? So it also provides you a heat map of who with something like a governance org need to be your key stakeholders and folks you need to work with. So it's multifaceted. Um, again, not an org chart, but it tells you the different areas. And I I often learn something of, oh my gosh, right, I hadn't thought of them, right? Uh, even though I've done this a million times. So um, helpful way and it's been a really successful way, especially with something, a merger and acquisition. 
Oh, and I mentioned uh, governance and the touch point to governance, and I know this is an architecture webinar, but governance and architecture are, are close cousins. Um, we use these as, when we build uh, data governance organizational structures to help identify that. So in several ways, one is to look at the organizational capabilities and across all of those, if you look on the right, as kind of a, a standard bulk standard um, data governance org structure that might be in like the DEMA DMBOK or the data management body of knowledge. If, if that's something you haven't read, it's a great, great tool to kind of um, learn a lot about the data management arena. Um, but to kind of map the org capabilities to your data governance committee. And that's more, you know, often when I see data governance going wrong, um, we come in and we'll say, you know, who's on the committee? Well, Joe and Mary and Felicia and like, who are they? Well, they're the people we know and are really excited. But with governance, you should be representing a business capability or a business group or a region or something, right? Because the whole idea of governance is accountability. So what do you have accountability for, right? Do you have accountability for finance? Do you have accountability for marketing? And that's why sort of mapping it back to a capability like that is an on the only way to do it. But it's a nice way to start to make sure that you're getting enterprise-wide coverage um, as well as kind of global coverage for that. So um, again, not this isn't a data governance webinar, but it's also nice to understand, you know, is this rather structured DEMA DMBOK approach always the best way for a governance committee? Maybe you're more feder federated, maybe you're a startup and there's five of you and you don't really need, you should do governance, but you don't need, you know, heavy several layer thing, right? So again, all of these are kind of multifaceted. And again, it doesn't have to be confusing. They can be one pagers, uh, but because the business is multifaceted, even more reason to map it out, right? From people to process to capabilities, et cetera. So um, this is a data architecture, so I can I can wax poetic about my favorite topic, data models, which work very, very well, especially in the enterprise architecture arena. Um, this is kind of the classic, if you haven't seen be before, kind of the, the pyramid model of sometimes starting with the enterprise uh, subject area model, a massive organization, what are even the main high level domains uh, you know, of customer and product and things like that, or more often, um, I, I see kind of starting with a conceptual model. That's kind of literally your one page version. I would say any company in the planet, your conceptual model should be one page. Um, if not, look to simplify it, right? Because that is the whole idea of you could be the largest company in the planet. You probably have still have customer, product, supplier, region. You know, there I started your model for you <laughs> if you're a retail company. Um, then of course, when you go down into the logical layer, you're going to have a lot more entities and relationships and business rules around that still at the business level with this business view. So I would still put on your logical model into that business centric enterprise architecture. And then also your physical model with your hundreds and thousands of ta tables and columns. Again, it, I am talking about particularly that business centric enterprise architecture view, but you know, think of the Zachman framework from the who, what, where, why, when, from networks to physical databases, you know, all levels from implementation to design, right? But this particular focus, because I just don't see it done enough, <laughs> is that link or or using these tools which are at our disposal to really just help quantify it. And I know I, I said it before, but as an architect, kind of having that light bulb, the, uh, the data architect, oh, I can architect other things. I can architect capabilities. I can architect people and their motivations. And I'm only giving you a subset of the ones either we use or that are available. But if this is new to you, um, you might kind of find some others in the EA toolkit that might kind of help you. So a conceptual data model, it is um, kind of that graphical view of the core concepts in an org. This particular view uh, is a data modeling tool that shows definitions, which I am a big fan of. It's kind of your glossary on steroids in a way, um, because you can not only see that employee is one of your core uh, concepts or entities of your org, but you can right there see the definition. And an employee is a full-time or part-time worker who's on active payroll. And someone might jump in and be like, oh, wait, part-time? Oh, no, no, no. Employees only full-time, part-time, we can call we call them interns. They would be in a different, you know, category, we, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? But people can start reacting to that right away. Um, is a customer and an individual or a company? Wait, I thought we sold B2C. Why are those customers? Maybe they should be contacts of a customer. Right, on and on and on those helpful conversations. If people aren't arguing or discussing your conceptual data model, you're not engaging them in the right way. Because I think that's what's kind of fun. In fact, I'm at, a, I'm at a conference this week and I gave some workshops and we kind of actually have like a sort of data modeling happy hour without the drinks, but it was everyone had some example of a simple word from, oh gosh, from a date to a, um, what, what a 
this was kind of grim, but what a death was, you know, what, what constituted a death from what a flavor was, to what a, um, a vehicle was, right? All of these things, if they're core to your business, you're going to have some discussion around it. And 90% of your model will probably get done very easily. And then those things that are probably your master and reference data are going to generate a lot of discussion. And that's healthy. It doesn't mean that we're being overly academic. On the contrary, it means you're hitting hitting the core of what your business does. And because so many people are touching it, they're going to have a different opinion. And that's where um, a data model um, can help either resolve those differences or clarify them or name them different things or whatever, right? Um, and I get asked this all the time. Um, and maybe I'm being overly simplistic, but I don't think so. There's kind of two choices. You either name it the same thing and agree on the definition or call it something different, right? And and I, again, sometimes that's just a really easy way to think of it. So here in this example, maybe you're a B2C and our, our customer should really be the company. So we name the company a customer and, and the what we're calling a customer here is maybe a, a customer contact, right? Or a, a person. Um, so it doesn't mean these things have to take forever. It's just a really good way to clarify what we mean here. And then you want to take it down to the logical model which is that next level of detail, your attributes, um, and under, under understanding all of the cardinality and business rules and things around that as well. And I think a lot of people on the call kind of understand data models. So, but what I think is more interesting is maybe some good use cases. So I'm gonna do a, a call out to a webinar. We did, gosh, it doesn't seem long ago, but I guess it was March, 2019, um, a company called Kiwit um, that we worked with and, and spoke with us. Um, so the, the replay is there. Um, I spoke a little bit, um, the the client spoke a lot, which is how it should be, um, that she gave her um, story of how we together built these data models. If you're not familiar with Kiwit, um, you're probably familiar with their work. They build a lot of the infrastructure in the U.S. from uh, from power plants to highways to the you know uh, major city reconstructions and things like that. So it was fun. Um, I always find it kind of funny when people talk about, quote, the business, right? We in IT or the technical side kind of generate, you know, the business. Well, that could be that could be a doctor, that could be a lawyer, that could be an engineer, that could be a construction worker, right? So in this case, it literally, these folks built things. So they looked at archi literally architecture diagrams all day, but architecture like building, right? So these data models, they loved and they really um, got into and helped understand. And so you'll see some uh, example of their conceptual data model on the right. It was a little bit more technical or detailed than a typical conceptual model because this group, they wanted to get right into the details. Again, they they really love diagrams. I think, so that's interesting in and of itself that, and I, I found this project fascinating, right? Of how you take a, con a major construction industry and map it out into your one page diagrams. But how he helped, um, design that or or organize it was one of the things I loved about working with Kiwit is they're a company of doers. They build stuff, right? And they had their whole company, again, not sharing anything that um, they didn't share in the webinar already, kind of organized, very simple, very concrete, no pun intended, <laughs> concrete, uh, getting things done, right? So they kind of already had some core capabilities mapped, right? They get work, they build work, and they take care of the assets that help you get work and then build more work, right? And they kind of had, you know, from a build work, even if you're not a, a construction engineer, you kind of get it. You design it, funny idea. Um, you plan it, you procure it, you control it, you construct it, and then you commission it off to the client, right? Very clear. Um, and so we organized our conceptual data models by these business capabilities, and it really, really resonated. A, we could go to the, you know, think of this almost, um, they were subject areas in the data model tool we used, um, that when we talked to the design team, we just honed it. There was a, a global enterprise model um, at the conceptual level, but when we talked to the design group, we just went into the subject area that was about design. We went to procurement. We just, you know, so the customer entity was the same, um, but you, the, we, we were, as architects, were able to see the overlap, but the people we were talking to just saw the data in the context of their business. So I thought this was a fun example for several reasons. One, a really good use case of business capability models for folks that were very proud of their business capabilities and getting things done. Um, and then that link to data, link to, to capability. And then of course, the because we talk about using you know architecture diagrams and it's just like building a house, this was exactly that. It's just like building a power plant. You've got a model, also you have a data model. So kind of a, a great way. And I, and I think too, those who say, you know, architecture is too academic, 
this was absolutely nothing wrong academic. I I love school, right? But but this was almost the antithesis of that. It was the company of let's let's get stuff done, get it done quickly, and commission it to the client. And we're able to use a business capability model to enhance that culture of getting stuff done, right? Which I loved. Okay, business process models. I think uh, in this realm of capable, you know, enterprise architecture or or models beyond data. In, in our practice, we use process models the most, especially with something like master data management. Um, I don't know how you would almost do master data management without that link to business process. To me, master data is kind of that intersection of business process data and then data governance for how you manage it, right? So if you're familiar and if you're, you've never done a process model, you probably can understand one pretty quickly. It, it's, it's like a workflow diagram, right? It, we call this a swim lane diagram. The swim lanes are... Like it look like a pool with people swimming, right? In each lane, uh, it's not Katie Ledecky. It's folks like product development or supply chain accounting or, or marketing. Those are the actors. They often are your data owners and stewards too, right? And they're going to do a thing from product development to costing and pricing to market testing to naming the product. This is a you know a product company, right? And then we overlay the data on top of that. So this this diagram on the right is kind of a loose, if you're familiar with the BPMN or the business process modeling notation, um, and they have notations like you'll see here, product development sends an email to costing and pricing, right? There's also, um, you know, I kind of customize it here, but you have a data overlay. So what data at each step of the way is used? Um, I didn't highlight it here, but you'll notice, and this was sort of anonymized from a real world example where um, they, they had uh, the supply chain accounting had a price for the product. And then when it went through market testing and actually got to the product, uh, actually there's been some things in the news where this happened. Think of the, um, what is it? Uh, Red Lobster that over, you know, they priced their all you can eat shrimp and it actually cost more <laughs> than the price of the, the product. Um, not to hit that company, they're not a client, but it was an example that people know, right? This company we had built one of these four had done the same thing, right? They were actually losing money with every sale because when they did the market testing and the product naming and pricing, supply chain and marketing weren't aligned, right? So this is a really good way. Um, I often do these in a workshop, right? And um, supply chain and, and marketing can kind of see, hey, we're using the same data. How do we want to manage this, right? Um, we had a really successful example of this um, with a big engineering company, and it was um, payment terms on their contract, right? They'd set the payment terms for 90 days in the contract. By the time it got to sale, for whatever reason, those payment terms have been changed for 30 days. And you can imagine if you're trying to forecast your business, that's a big difference, right? So we we literally did one of these in a work whiteboard session and the two parties, the person who did the, the contract said, hey, folks down there, why aren't you using it? And they literally said, because I didn't know it was there. Okay, I'll use it. <laughs> I cannot guarantee that success that quickly. Um, but I like to say nobody comes to work trying to make data bad. They probably don't understand the downstream effect or what else is available. So this is a really good way to get kind of people working together and seeing that big picture across teams I and mean, getting folks together to, to work through that. Kind of the, a cousin or a similar idea from a, a business process. I, I like these processes, especially in a very process-centric arena like, like manufacturing, right? Um, ABC, and, and these may already exist, right? And so I, I should have said that earlier. For a lot of these tools, you may build them yourself. Or even ask, do you have an end? I have gone to clients and we ask and, and suddenly there's an enterprise architecture team. People didn't realize and some of these models already exist, right? Or has engineering already done their own workflow, process flow for their process and you can map overlay data onto that. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel for all of these. Um, similarly, the, the processes work with very process-centric um, engagements, and but customer journey map is, is similar, but it's from the customer perspective, right? Or the patient perspective or the student perspective or any human that you are, or your, your citizen, if you're a government, right? Um, and this one particularly is kind of a fictitious customer journey, right? From when they maybe first discover you and they attend a trade show and give you their card and then they request more literature and then they purchase and order it and have it shipped and then join the loyalty program, right? Those are, this is almost your classic master data management challenge, right? That each one of these boxes probably has a different system, a different definition of customer and and trying to get, you know, how, how more frustrating is that from, I don't know, I rant about these all the time, right? If I, I change my address on the website of the vendor I'm working with and I still get my mail sent to a wrong address. And I know, and you probably know why that happens. The systems aren't talking to each other. The people aren't talking to each other, right? How frustrating is that from the customer journey perspective? So mapping it out this way, either 
you know, helps you create that map and understand the touch points and what needs to un understand and also create some empathy, right? So we can really understand what that experience is and, and truly try to um, prioritize this. We had worked with one big retail company um, and they had this experience. Um, they'll remain uh, anonymous, but, you know, you, this was a, a high-end product you bought in the store and you actually went into the store and you gave your you know, the, the sales rep said, can I get your email? And if you're like me, you probably said, go away at stupid.com, right? <laughs> and then, but then it was a really good product and I wanted to buy it. So I went to the buy it and tried to have it shipped. Um, and I gave my correct email because I wanted to track the shipment. Something went wrong. They had my first email, right? The go away at stupid.com. So I called support and it was a bit of a nightmare, right? So we actually built all of these enterprise architecture diagrams with sales, with marketing, with IT, um, and it was really, really successful. I think uh, I'm not showing one here, but the head of marketing actually said, man, I, I never thought I'd use the word data flow diagram, but you're the first one to explain why this problem had happened. Um, and so it was a really way to take something in this case, really simple, like email address and how it's affecting the customer experience and ultimately sales and map it out in kind of a customer customer centric way overlaid with data. So big fan of those um, kind of the friend of this is the one that no one used on the survey. So please start using them. They're so simple. Again, I think one of the goals of architecture is to create simplicity out of complexity. Um, and so think of all of those steps in your, your process flow. They can kind of um, uh, go along the top, right? Product development, supply chain, accounting, marketing, finance, et cetera. And then your data elements, either at a high level, product, customer, et cetera, or at the kind of um, attribute level, like your price here, and that was the example we showed earlier. Supply chain accounting created it, marketing updated it, and then finance read it. But but the fact that marketing overwrote the product, um, the the price that didn't align with accounting, a, a, should it be a different price, a different field? Um, should they coordinate the same field, et cetera, et cetera? But it helps really make that clear. And I find a lot of those gnarly pro problems you find in a company, either bad customer service or bad data, is when you either have two C's, two people are creating the same data in different places, or a C and a U, someone's creating it, and someone's overriding it and updating it later, like the payment term example I gave, where contracts spent a long time creating the payment terms, and someone else changed it down the road. Like, how do we not have that happen through both governance, et cetera, but you you need to map that out first. And then read, you know, sometimes we think, oh, someone's just reading it, but just means they're actually using it for their day job. So they should have a voice and a governance thing as well. I need this for my job. I need it in a full format that works or I need it populated and things like that. So really simple tool, the really terrible name, um, but really, really helpful. So I would recommend using those. So, and so these process models in the CredMason trees, I sort of just said that, but they, they do fit nicely together. And this is just more of a kind of visual of that. So, you know, for each step, receive order, fill order, et cetera, you're going to put down either at a, this one's a little more high level than the previous one that was at the attribute level. This is more at the, just the entity level. Who's using customer? Who's using account? And, and you can do it both ways. Maybe start with that high level. Where is even customer data touched? Where are you know, product data touched? And then go down to that level of detail. So often when people ask about, you know, governance, for something like master data, like product. And I say, I actually go down to the attribute level and people look at me in shock. I'm like, how do you, how do you not? Right. So my classic example I give is that you go to the doctor, right. And, and I would be, that would be patient master. So who owns patient data, right? I, I come in and I give my insurance card to the clerk at the front desk and they own my insurance company. And then I go to the doctor and they have my medical history and my diagnosis. And those are very different data attributes <laughs> about patient. And I wouldn't want the doctor doing my insurance and I wouldn't want the person doing my insurance defining my prognosis, right? So um, I think that's a good example of you really, you know, each step of the way, people are going to be responsible and accountable for different data along that process. And uh, these process models and CRUD matrices with a data overlay um, can really be helpful. Um, so this is a, a case study um, I wanted to show that worked really, really well. Um, it was a pharmaceutical company where a uh, major big name one would all be familiar with, where they did everything from clinical development to commercializing to R&D, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They actually had had a really bad experience in the past with data models and things like that. And it wasn't anything with the do with the data model. It was how it was done. And that could be another conversation. So we just <laughs> I don't always recommend this. We just call them blueprints, right? They said, great. We don't 
want that other thing, but the Ada blueprints are great. So um, if you're familiar with the pharma process or especially that clinical development life cycle, that's very, very process centric. So um, we did end up doing the, the process maps related in detail to the clinical development cycle. But we also did things like how do we kind of sell or promote the services of IT to these groups, right? And we didn't, if you can use some of the words there, it was more about business capability planning and solution planning. It really wasn't just about data, right? And, and we mapped out the business needs, the capabilities of the pharma company to really understand and help prioritize. And then we integrated data into all of the project um, like life cycle steps. So I think the best thing that we were excited about is that we walked into these PhD, people smarter than me, clinical, doing clinical development, saving people's lives. They literally had both the process map with the data on it and they had the data models. And even better, they had the data models marked up with a pencil, right? So for folks that say, you know, the quote business that can be very broad, doesn't understand data models. Of course they did, that was their business, right? So when they needed a new piece of data or information or data wasn't flowing in their clinical life cycle product process, they had these blueprints that they could use as a communication mechanism that were important enough that they had up on the wall. And then when they had changes, they could bring that up and, you know, they're kind of brainstorming themselves. And I thought that was really great. And I think also um, by integrating so clearly with the business process and the business value, the data architecture team really became more just ingrained of the who we are and what we do and how we can help. Just was, you know, pun intended, but like really into the DNA of the company and how they could, how they worked, right? And, and, and again, and just like I gave the example of the construction company, like construction diagrams and architecture diagrams were really close to them. Um, you know, the, the, these folks were, were scientists, right? So understanding models and patterns was really close to what they did. So they, they got these really well. Um, and again, you may not have clients or your company may not be, um, you know, architects or, or scientists, but gosh, business people understand PowerPoints, right? And a high level model can, can fit very nicely in PowerPoint. So I, I think no matter what your industry, these can be really helpful tools. So uh, uh, system architecture diagrams, these again can be a big picture. And again, I, I always say if you're hiring an architect and you ask them a question and they don't look around for a whiteboard, you probably have the right wrong person. <laughs> but um, I, again, I, I can't not do these. So we're, we're planning out, say, a, a data transformation. The one at the top can be a really high level view of your different components, right? We have reporting analytics and governance and the discovery in the lake and enterprise systems of record and the master and reference data, security and privacy, right? Those are the high level, almost like a checklist of the different component, how they interact. And at some point, excuse me, you're going to want to get to that one at the bottom, which is maybe your logical view, or you could argue maybe even conceptual view, right? This is kind of your classic data lake house environment where here are my operational systems from regular, um, applications to sensor data, social media, video files, they, they land in the lake, they're integrated with master data, we store it in warehouse, semantic layer reporting, AI, advanced analytics, right? Still pretty high level, but you learn a lot with these. And again, when, when we develop a lake house, we can't not do this, right? How I almost don't know how you don't, right? So that's going to help you prioritize the systems on the left, all of your different data types, what are the data flows, um, what are your master data areas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Really helpful way um, to understand. And I've had, again, even business people understand these because it's at a high level enough. You'll see with ours, sometimes we'll use icons, right? You've got, I think this might've been a, um, well, anonymized from a transportation company, right? You've got sensor data on your trucks. Well, <laughs> that data goes into your lake, right? It's a little picture of the truck. You're not talking down to people. You're, you're making that more clear and a way to understand. So big fan of those as well. Um, so in summary, and I did, Shannon's not here to give me credit for actually leaving Q&A, but. <laughs> I'll give you credit. Thank you, thank you. Because she always yells at me for going too long. I mean, encourages me to give time. So um, in sum, <laughs> enterprise architecture is a series of models and diagrams that describe an orb and maximize business value. So that should be clear to people who are used to architecture um, and it helps you take your data architecture which you may already have documented and really um, explicitly map that to business needs and priorities so if you're not doing these just I would say just start with a few 
start with a process model, start with some capability maps and kind of see how that helps the conversation. Um, just a quick call out before I do open up the Q&A. Um, if you want to join us next month, we will delve in. I showed my hand. I love data modeling, right? So next month, we'll go into not necessarily only just data modeling, but the business benefits, which ties into a lot of what we kind of talked about today. Um, full plug, we do this for a living at Global Data Strategy. So if you need help, let us know. <laughs> Info at globaldatastrategy.com. And for now, I will pass it over for Q&A. So thanks. Donna, thank you so much. Um, even though I'm a data modeler from way back when, <laughs> I learned a lot today. And we have a bunch of questions. I know we won't get to all of them. So I'm going to recommend that everyone follow Donna on LinkedIn. And if you have questions from this presentation, uh, follow the previous presentations that you can find on Dataversity net at on-demand webinars and join us for successive sessions where Donna will delve deeper and maybe answer some of the questions we don't get to today. I have one question. Is business capability a form of business process modeling? Good question. Um, no, they're, they're similar, um, but uh, different. So a process model, think of that of your flow, like a workflow. Right. I'm uh, well, let's let's start with the cap capabilities would just be literally the things your company does uh, that are static. Right. I have a I have finance. I have manufacturing. I have marketing. Right. For each of those capabilities, you're going to have one or more process models. So think of finance. Right. It's send in <laughs> don't, finance. People don't laugh at me, but it's, you know, send in invoice, receive payment, log payment. Right. It's all the steps that people in finance do. So that's why I think there's a separate model for each one. It's just identifying the capabilities. The other one's identifying the actions that those capabilities take, if that makes sense. Thank you, Donna. That makes a lot of sense. Um, another question. Do you see the role of data architecture at a higher enterprise architecture level or closer to development teams? For example, a data architecture team that is part of an IT application development team, or should they be at a higher level? I think it's a both and, um, and I won't move my slides or I'm going to get lost, but um, a little bit earlier, I kind of showed that, well, both uh, frameworks, but the the Zockman framework kind of has the who, what, where, why, when, and then at every level from the, the business level to the IT level. So um, I, I think sometimes there are different people. I, I mean, I'm a bias that everyone should be focusing on the business, but often there's kind of a um, an e, uh, a business focused architect that might do say the the enterprise conceptual data model they might work with the enterprise architects they may get down to the logical level and then you may pass it over to uh, a data engineer who might do the phys physical model or that system architecture diagram I mean sometimes especially if you're a small company and you've got some really smart people that one person can do it all but typically if you think of the roles there's kind of a enterprise slash business focused role and then there's more of the implementation um, the technical role. And then even amongst those, there may be some separate, right? So the person, the data engineer who designs the data warehouse technical model may be different than the person who builds the system architecture diagram and decides, do we use, you know, Databricks or Snowflake or whether it's cloud or on-prem and that kind of thing. But th those teams, ideally, they need to talk to each other because they're all related. So hope that helps. Okay. Um, what suggestions do you have for breaking down executive silos in the public sector? Uh, good luck. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I <laughs> I'm had a bad day. Um, well, I think, and, I, and not to be Pollyanna, but what I've seen work really well, especially in the public sector, is that motivation model I showed in the beginning. Because I found, you know, I think I have, you know, I'm not making a adjustment, but I, folks have said that, you know, public sector can be a bit more political because often it's, it's, it's literally more political as politics and government center. But a lot of people are very driven by the mission, right? And they want to get things done. So the more you can, or and this, this can be true in a for-profit, a non-for-profit company. And I'm not being naive. I think most people come to work wanting to do what they came to work to do, right? So the more that we can align data with you know, say in the public sector, we're going to help citizens. We had one, we worked with um, a public sector company and it was either down to the very granular, one, one, one person we interviewed said, I want to help people to renew their driver's license in their pajamas. And I love that person because I love renewing my driver's license in the pajamas, right? Some people were at the same company were much more 
civically focused of, you know, I want to make sure this is the best place to live, best city to live. And I want to make sure data helps enable that, right? So the more you can align on that and less on silos, that we're all trying to help the citizen and we're all trying to get projects done or wh whatever it is you're trying to do, I think that helps break down a bit because you're showing kind of that common goal. And I would say that's not even just public sector, that's just every company because, you know, I think, and that's where either the, the well, actually all of them, right? The, the, the mission and the motivation model, this is why we're doing it. The capabilities are, and the process models are how, and again, sometimes just mapping out. And, and again, people don't always see the impact of the data on other people. And I think we're all naturally empathetic so that, you know, no one's trying to make other people's lives difficult. Sometimes just showing that um, and kind of seeing the impact. I, I've seen both of those things kind of help of uh, line on the common mission and then get a little more detailed of showing explicitly how the touch points between data help each either help or hurt each other. Donna, I think that's a fantastic idea to model motivations and capabilities before you get to processes, et cetera, because mm -hmm. without understanding the motivations, without understanding the capabilities, it will be difficult to really, one, break down those silos, and two, develop to the level you need that common view of an architecture and yeah. data and processes that go with it. Thank you so much for talking about motivation modeling. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of all of this stuff when you step back doesn't have, it's basic. Are we all trying to do the same thing before we start going and doing it, right? Right. <laughs> you think of it that way, it's like, yeah, why wouldn't we do that? And I think that many organizations overlook the motivations. They dive right into, excuse me for being pedantic, but the physical model. <laughs> and yeah. you really yeah. have to take it much higher up. I have a question here for you. How would a racy matrix fit into an EA program? At this uh, particular well, organization's PMO is very focused on racies. Love myself a good racy. Um, I, I would kind of put it up <laughs> with, uh, so if, if anyone is not familiar with a racy, um, it, it's it's sort of, well, I, I will back up. We usually generate a kind of a, a think of those capabilities. I'll just start with a capability model or an org chart, right? Who are all the stakeholders across the org that may be impacted or even just in, in the realm of data in this area, right? And what a RACI then, and there's, a, there's other similar types of methodologies, but RACI is then who's responsible, who's accountable, who's consulted, and then who's informed, right? And I think that's really, really helpful kind of at that business level of the motivations and the capabilities and the process of you know, some people actually have to be accountable. There's your, or, or responsible, that's your data governance, but make sure that people are informed. You know, it's, it, in some ways, it's kind of a business level of that CRUD matrix. I never thought of that before, right? It's like some people are reading it. They still have the same um, voice in the organization of, hey, I need this. I need to know what's happening with the data orgs. So that's kind of the I and the RACI. So yeah, I'm a big fan of that. I've talked about that in other rate, um, webinars where we generally do kind of a stakeholder matrix to the RACI. And I, I think it's a great idea. And also, I, I often say kind of with data governance, with voice comes responsibility. Like if you, you know, you, you may want to have um, be a data steward because you get to be kind of part of the club, but you also now are held accountable for the quality of data you're working with. And then you get an R and you're racing. You're responsible for this. So big fan. Yeah, I think like, thanks for bringing that up, whoever. Oh, thank you, Donna. Uh, thinking back to races and crud matrices. Yeah, they are aligned, aren't they? Yeah, I never thought of that. See, I teach myself stuff in these <laughs> or, or people teach me from the questions. I love it. And I'm so glad I was part of this webinar because I just thought of something I never thought of before. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, we have several other questions, but we are running out of time so we can thank everyone and wind up the webinar on time. If you have more questions and want to pose them to Donna, either connect with her on LinkedIn, uh, go to Global Strategies website, or, or not or, and come back next <laughs> month to her really interesting session on where they'll dive more into data models, something we both love. And I hope to see you again, uh, December, the business benefits of data modeling. Looking forward to seeing everyone there. Please bring your friends. <laughs> Let everyone know who is in the data realm that this is a valuable series. And for now, we bid you a good day. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Donna. Henry. Great working with you again. Bye-bye.